So let's start with the uh, central nervous system, Judy. I was meaning to start it off with a few basic concepts I feel everyone should know. Now I put it at a level where it's very basic so that uh, it's not only for MBBS students but uh, dental students or allied health students or nursing students uh, will understand this topic. So let's start with central nervous system and introduction to central nervous system. Again, I'm telling you this is a very basic thing and I want you to understand these few basic things because we're going to build on these few basic concepts in the future when we're going to the central nervous system in proper. So these certain concepts, these certain things are there which you have to understand and it will make life easier for you once you understand this. So we'll get right to it. So what is the first thing? What is the basic unit of nervous system? The basic unit of nervous system is the neuron. Right? So we have many neurons and all these neurons are interconnected. It's like a whole web, series of interconnected web. Okay, we got the central nervous system, we got the peripheral nervous system and you got neurons everywhere. Okay, so that neuron is a basic unit. Now you can see over here, a neuron has a dendrite, a cell body or soma and axon and this is a neuron with a dendrite cell body and an axon and it connects to other neurons through synapses. So through the various synapses, it connects to different neurons and they are highly interconnected. One uh, neuron receives input from multiple different neurons and one gives to many others as well. So this is an example of an unmyelinated neuron. You can see over here, a myelinated neuron. So uh, this part over here is called the axon hillock. So we got the dendrite, we got the cell body, the soma, we got the axon, this point where cell body ends and the axon begins, that is the axon hillock. And then comes the axon and this is the initial part of the axon. And after that you can notice over here how there is a myelin sheet covering these axons. So myelin is there. So this is a myelinated neuron. So you can see the difference between an unmyelinated and a myelinated neuron over here. Alright. So when we talk about um, neurons in general, based on the polarity, polarity as in from the cell body, how many poles are rising? Based on the polarity, we can classify them into unipolar, bipolar, multipolar. So Unipolar cells are generally not present, unipolar as such are generally not present in vertebrates, in primitive invertebrates, you see unipolar. So unipolar means there's a cell body, from that one pole arises and from that one pole you have one branching. So that will have the axon, dendrite, whatever. So that one pole acts to give out either axon or dendrite or both. So there is only one pole over here. So there is a concept of pseudo unipolar. So some textbooks mention pseudo unipolar to be part of uh, unipolar as well. So the only difference that you can see is uh, there is only one pole. But what happens is in pseudo unipolar from that one pole whatever comes out further branches into two. On one side it goes to become an axon, one side dendrite. But ultimately from the cell body there is only one pole. So one pole and which splits further into axon and uh, dendrite. But in case of unipolar there is one pole and there is only one segment that comes out. And that itself forms the axon and dendrite as you can see over here. Okay, so the pseudo unipolar are generally seen uh, in our dorsal root ganglia. So especially uh, our sensory signals that come from different parts of the body, all that comes through the dendrite, it reaches the dorsal root ganglia which is a pseudo unipolar type of neuron and a branch of it goes to the axon and goes to the dorsal root ganglia, sorry dorsal horn cell, okay. So that is a pseudo unipolar and the other example is bipolar, here you can see two poles are there, cell body is there, on one side there is a axon on the other side there is a dendrite so two poles are arising from the body 
Now, how is it different from a multipolar? You can see over here. So, multipolar, what you can see is there are multiple poles. So, there's an axon here, and there are multiple poles over here from which dendrites are present. So, in bipolar, there are only two poles. In multipolar, there are multiple poles. So, there are various examples in our body where these different things are there. Like the pyramidal cells, cell H cells, these are all multipolar in the cortex. Well, bipolar, one good example of that is uh, your uh, cells, ganglion cells in the, or bipolar uh, cells in the uh, retina. Okay, so that is generally a bipolar, multipolar, pseudo unipolar. So you understand the gist of it. So that is regarding that. Now, when you look into your neuron, you have the dendrite, this is an example of a multipolar. We have a cell body, we have the terminal buttons that finally form the synapse. This forms the presynaptic terminal. And this is the axon helix that I mentioned earlier. This is the initial segment of the axon. And then comes the Schwann cells, which is wrapping around the axon. And you can see the node of Ranvi, which are gaps in between these miles. So these are Schwann cells that you see over here. So these Schwann cells form a myelin sheet and between them there are gaps called the node of Ranvi. So what is this axon hillock and initial segment? Why am I keeping on repeating it? So this is another concept I want you to understand. It will help you understand a lot of things in synapse in general. So when you talk about a neuron, when signals come from another neuron and reaches one neuron, so this space in between is a synapse. So this is a presynaptic terminal, this is a postsynaptic terminal. So here the postsynaptic terminal is the dendrite. And the presynaptic terminal are these terminal buttons of the axon. So action potential reaches here. Finally, neurotransmitters. This is a chemical synapse, and neurotransmitters are released over here. And similar thing happens over here. So one neuron is receiving impulses from many different places. Now, because of this, when the neurotransmitter acts on the receptors present in the postsynaptic membrane, what is going to happen is there will be a graded potential. Okay, a graded receptor potential will be there. So, this is not an action potential. Only if it reaches a certain threshold, it will be an action potential. So, this is one concept I want you to understand. So this can be a excitatory postsynaptic potential or it can be an inhibitory postsynaptic potential based on the interaction of the neurotransmitter with the receptor. So this can be an excitatory or an inhibitory. So say for in this example, they're both excitatory. So one excitatory postsynaptic potential and another EPSP. So these two EPSPs will come together on the postsynaptic membrane, the dendrites over there and they will submit. They are not action potentials yet. They are just graded potentials. So two graded potentials we put together, they are going to submit. Yes. And now once, say this has submitted and reached the level where it has reached a threshold value. Once it has reached a threshold value, it is going to become an action potential. So where is this action potential generated? So that is where your initial segment comes. So the axon hillock in the initial segment, that is where your action potentials are generated. I hope this is clear. So, it depends on the different types of interactions that are there with other synapses. So, it can be excitatory, it can be inhibitory, and finally, the output is dependent on the sum of all this. If there are enough inhibitory to make it come below the threshold, there won't be an action potential. If there are enough inputs, which are excitatory in nature, they, that is going to result in an action potential. So this is how your neuronal pool works. So you can see over here how they are interconnected, how complicated they seem. How one is connected to multiple and one is receiving from multiple. And you can observe it over here. This is one neuron. You can see the different signals. All these hair-like things are post-presynaptic terminals coming from different neurons. They are merging at the dendrite, at the soma, different areas. And finally, based on the addition, summation of all these, finally an action potential will be generated if it reaches a threshold value. 
So this is how neurons act. Okay, so that is another concept that is clear. Now, apart from neurons, neurons are not the only cells that are there. There are other cells which are there in your nervous system, whether central or peripheral. So these are what are called glial cells. Glial cells play a, a very important role. So I'm not going to go much into detail now. Maybe I can do a separate video on just glial cells. For a basic understanding, I'll just briefly tell you what glial cells are. I just go to the important ones like uh, oligodendrocytes, Schwann cells, and astrocyte, just for you to understand a few basic things. Okay. Um, one example is oligodendrocyte. We got ependymal cells. We got astrocytes. We got microglia, and we got Schwann cells and satellite cells. So these on the top are things that are there in the central nervous system, and these two below are there in the peripheral nervous system. Now the ones that I marked in blue color, these are involved with myelination. So oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells are involved in myelination. Oligodendrocyte is involved in myelination in the central nervous system, while in the peripheral nervous system, Schwann cells are involved. Ependymal cells are cells generally lining the uh, ventricles. So it is involved in CS of formation and all that. Astrocytes, now they are a special uh, group of glial cells. So they kind of form a bridge. I'll show you the diagram later. They kind of form a bridge between capillaries and the neuron and helps in forming the blood brain barrier. Apart from that, they have many other functions. Excess glutamate is there, it takes it in, okay, and uh, also in some nutritive functions. And it also has many other functions like uh, in memory formation so neurons synapse there are memory formation this astrocytes help in pruning and all that along with microglia so that is your astrocytes hmm? now microglia are like scavenger cells so all over the body different tissues have their own specific set of uh, scavenger systems so like Kupfer cells in the liver histiocytes langerhans cells in the skin like that, every part of the body has different macrophage system. So, in the central nervous system, you have the microglial cells, which is scavenge. Okay. Now, Schwann cells I've already mentioned. Now, satellite cells are kind of similar to your astrocytes, but they are located in the um, peripheral nervous system. I said kind of similar, not everything. There's no blood brain barrier, nothing like that. It kind of helps regulate the internal environment. Now, there are a separate set of satellite cells when you talk about muscles which kind of helps in hypertrophy and all that so we'll do all that later so i just want you to understand that there are terms like this there are other cells okay and out of that um as i said Schwann cell oligodendrocyte and astrocytes okay at least that you have to understand so this is a diagram of oligodendrocyte that you can see over here so you can see and appreciate how one oligodendrocyte is forming myelin for multiple different axons. On the other hand, when you talk about Schwann cell, there is one Schwann cell over here with its nucleus, and this forms spiraling myelin around an axon, one axon, and that to one part. There's a separate Schwann cell here, separate Schwann cell here, and each forms separate. And this is only for one axon. For another axon, this is a completely different Schwann cell. But oligodendrocytes give myelin for multiple. Now, the kind of difference between this oligodendrocyte and Schwann cell is that uh, I said Schwann cells are there in the peripheral nervous system and oligodendrocytes are there in the central nervous system. Now, peripheral nervous system, the Schwann cells have a good replicative function. In case there is damage and all that, Schwann cells can readily form the myelin again. They are they're involved in the whole uh, degeneration, regeneration procedure actively. Oligodendrocytes are also involved, but the problem is they end up sometimes forming fibrous tissue. They activate fibrous tissue. Okay, so they activate fibril bars and finally uh, a fibrous scar-like tissue is formed, which does not bode well to a structure like the central nervous system where neurons should be there okay so that is your central nervous system 
and peripheral nervous system when it comes to myelination. The other glycel that I was talking to you about is astrocyte. So astrocyte, you can see over here how it's bridging on either side a neuron and a capillary. You can see end foot. So there's a capillary, there's a neuron and it's bridging them. Okay, and you can see the end foot over here. So they have these end foots with which pads, pad-like structures with which they attach themselves on either side. Okay, now, uh, yes, I'll uh, explain blood-brain barrier and all that later in another lecture. So that is it about the glial cells. Now we'll come to components of the CNS. One by one, we'll take a look at the different parts, understand what is there in the CNS first. Okay, and then we'll go to the spinal cord. So when you talk about the CNS, we got the cerebral hemisphere, the cortex, main cortex. And below that, subcortical structures are there. So inside the whole, this part of the brain, there is a cortex, cerebral hemispheres. Under that, there are subcortical structures. And below that, we got the brain stem. And below that is the spinal cord. So this cerebral hemisphere is what you see over here. It is called the T encephalon. Below it are diencephalic structures. So this sub thalam sub cortical structures like thalamus, subthalamus, hypothalamus are all involved over there. And then below that is the brain stem. And this brain stem has your midbrain, your pons, and the medulla. So they make up the brain stem. And you can see over here the cerebellum behind it. And below that is a spinal cord. So, you know, the spinal cord has different levels, like right? cervical, uh, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and all that. Okay, so let's just try to understand how this forms. Now, the whole of uh, nervous system kind of formed from your ectoderm. Your, when you're an embryo, you have an endoderm, mesoderm, ectoderm. From the ectoderm, which also forms the skin, part of it, from the neural plate, neural crest, and things like that, and it forms a fold. So outside there is all this other things which form mesenchymal structures and all that. Inside there is the endoderm, and you got this ectoderm forming a conical structure, a cylindrical conical structure, and the tip of it bulges out, right? And that forms the brain and the spinal cord. Okay, so finally what it looks like is this it'll have a part over here and then another part over here and a third part over here and it goes down as a spinal cord so we got the prosencephalon which is forebrain then the mesencephalon which is the midbrain and we got the rhombencephalon which is the hindbrain and then we got the spinal cord apart from that uh, from neural crest different other structures come on the side and all so you don't have to concern yourself with all that right now. So just to make it more clear, we got the prosencephalon. So prosencephalon is this whole area on top, which is your cortex and diencephalon. So that is your telencephalon, which is the cerebral hemisphere, along with your diencephalon. So diencephalon includes your thalamus, hypothalamus, right? And uh, that is your uh, prosencephalon, the forebrain. Now, apart from that, we got the mesencephalon. So, mesencephalon is the midbrain. Now, your brainstem has two other things, the pons and the uh, medulla. So, these are formed from the rhombencephalon. So, just know that rhombencephalon further divides into two things, a meta and a myelin. So, this meta forms the pons and the myelencephalon forms the medulla. So, finally, your brain is formed. The cortex, subcortical structures, along with your brainstem is formed and below it your spinal cord is formed. So that is about a general orientation of your um, nervous system. Now we'll go to your spinal cord. This is kind of a little important because when you talk about sensory or motor pathways or whatever, a basic understanding of your spinal cord structures and the pathways and the grey matter, white matter helps more than you think. So we got the spinal cord structure over here. If I take a cross section over here, you'll know that there is a white matter outside and this colored part inside, the blue and the uh, orangish one, 
that is your gray matter so outside we got the white matter we got the gray matter inside so gray matter is where all the neuron cell bodies are there and this is where all the fibers are there we'll come to that usually later so you can see uh, nerves coming they form plexus over here then there's a whole root and then the ganglia and then it goes like this there are two sets one posteriorly one anteriorly that is one dorsally and ventrally so whatever is coming through the dorsal the dorsal is for reception sensation so anything that is coming from different parts of the body even if it's a mixed nerve in the mixed nerve it comes together but the fibers that are sensory in function go back dorsally and go away and it goes to the posterior this blue color area is the posterior greyhound so apart from uh, posterior and anterior there's a lateral as well which is involved with autonomic functions okay so uh, we got the posterior greyhound so things that are sensory in function go and reach the posterior greyhound and the ventral one is your motor function it goes from your spinal cord and goes outside to different parts of your body for motor activity okay so that is the posterior greyhound and then your anterior greyhound so greyhound are where uh, the cells are present the neuron cell cell body the neurons are present okay so uh, you can appreciate it a little better over here so this is an example of someone accidentally stepping on a needle the sensations come from that part it goes so you don't have time for a conscious perception okay you don't step on a, a needle and start thinking about the philosophy of why i'm having pain or when i should move my leg or anything it comes as a reflex just like that okay so it does not go all the way to your cortex yet before that action through reflex happens so this goes you can see how it is going through your dorsal root ganglia you can see that pseudo unipole i was talking about and comes over here where it goes to your dorsal horns and through into neuron that is going to connect and will go to the anterior horn cell and from there you can see that through the ventral root it is going to the muscle and making it active okay so uh, just a magnified image of the same thing so this is what is called a bell magenti law so according to bell magenti law what you have to understand is the posterior the dorsal is where things come in so you receive sensations and the ventral is where things go out or the motor functions okay so if you were to divide your spinal cord into two that is how it will be now you can see this diagram uh, through the whole process of learning central nervous system you will come to understand all this it looks confusing but it's not really okay so we will just have to understand that this thing is gray matter and all these things outside is the white matter so just to avoid the confusion i'll remove all this so things that come in go over here things that go out come out from this part right so now that we removed all the distractions things that come in come over here so there's one neuron over here right in the gray matter there is one neuron consider this to be a neuron not a well represented one but of course i'm meaning it to be a, a neuron a cell body so this neuron receives this impulse now after receiving it should go all the way to the brain these impulses should reach brain how does it go to the brain so from here now the white matter structure that you see on the sides th these are bundles which contain just fibers so this is where the fibers go up or come down okay so it can go posteriorly like this dorsal column pathway can go laterally like this can go anteriorly like this so sensations coming from different parts of the body finally are segregated and either go through posterior the dorsal or lateral or the anterior so from different parts of the spinal cord they'll go okay now another example where you can see a neuron cell over there that is a motor function so consider this to be an alpha motor neuron so to stimulate alpha motor neuron impulses should come from the brain to tell that okay you should move it or unless it's a sensory 
function going into a reflex where it directly comes from here and stimulates it. But finally, this has to be stimulated. So let's just take an example where the motor cortex is telling us to move certain things. So this thing should come from your brain cortex through pyramidal tracts. These tracts again come through these fibers on the sides like this. Okay, so it can come like this and stimulate it or it can come like this and stimulate it. So the lateral and the anterior, you'll come, we'll come to understand that later. So basically from the white matter fibers come, they come stimulated and from here it goes out now. Okay, so this is an example of the various ways by which we sense things in our body. You can see different uh, receptors, there are different kinds of receptors. All of these are coming to the spinal cord through the same route. But they get segregated into different pathways, they get segregated into different second order neurons and finally they go to different parts over here. They go to thalamus, they go to different parts and finally reach a, uh, some metasensory area. And some proprioceptive signals are also important for cerebellum to maintain balance and all that. So this is your sensory thing. So for that, you have to understand how it goes through your spinal cord. And again the motor. So motor has the motor areas. Then other structures like the cerebellum, basal ganglia, which are involved in motor activity and coordination. And finally, it goes down and some reticular areas are also there, which are involved in maintaining posture and all. So it goes down through the white matter again, that diagram I had shown earlier, and from there it goes to the muscle. So this is again a concise version of things that you have to understand. So in short, this is what you have to understand. There is a gray matter which has neuronal structures. So there is a posterior horn and the anterior horn. So anterior horn receives things. Posterior horn, sorry, anterior horns gives out motor functions, and posterior horn has cells which receive sensations. And finally, it is the white matter through which all the bundles move up or down. So we got the spinal cord. The central part of the spinal cord is all the neuronal structures and finally the bundles are all outside. Okay, so that is it with regards to some basic key concepts that you need to understand with uh, central nervous system. Okay, and using this as a foundation, we'll go on to understand few other basic things one by one. Like the CSF or blood brain barrier or synapse or ascending descending pathways, whatever. All right, so thank you. Uh -huh.